Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, lecture number 24. We're going to talk about visual processing basics today. And um, the study of vision is, uh, you know, of all the senses, is probably the one that uh, behavioral neuroscientists have been able to make uh, the most progress in. And we're going to be talking uh, about some uh, older research, uh, as well as some uh, more recent work that has been done in this area um, uh, in, in our, uh, our next lecture. But today what I want to do is really lay the groundwork for um, uh, some of that uh, more recent work uh, that has been done. Uh, so when we talk about the biological basis of vision, uh, what we're doing is we're talking about um, uh, what happens when we perceive a stimulus, uh, a visual stimulus and the chain of events that occurs um, uh, beginning with our, uh, uh, with the eyes uh, and what happens with the receptors uh, in the eyes, um, how that information is transferred uh, to various parts of the brain, namely uh, to the back of the brain uh, in the striate cortex. Uh, and then how that information uh, ultimately gets to, to other parts of the brain. So, um, you know, we have, um, you know, quite a bit on our, our plate uh, for uh, this lecture today. So let's begin by talking a little bit about what I call the limitations of our visual system. Uh, I think that, um, you know, as good as our... Um, our visual senses are, um, you know, oftentimes we're in situations where we think that we see things, but uh, we really don't. And obviously that has uh, important implications for our legal system. Um, you know, those limitations that we have, uh, imperfections in some ways in terms of our visual system, uh, you know, we try to impose order on what we see, and sometimes our ability to do that, uh, impose that order, and impose that organization, um, uh, is something that we can't can't really do. Uh, again, because of limitations that we have uh, uh, in vision. You know, consider what happens in a court of law, uh, oftentimes where we have eyewitness testimony. Uh, you know, what did you see during that particular event? Are you sure that you saw what you saw? Uh, and um, those uh, uh, imperfections uh, that we have um, can oftentimes lead to erroneous conclusions. Uh, so again, um, our visual system, as great as it is, uh, has uh, limitations, and it's those limitations that I want to give a, you know, a little bit of uh, background uh, in uh, before we begin to take a look at the biology of visual processing. Um, so uh, some of the more uh, uh, well-known, better known uh, visual illusions, uh, certainly this is one here, you know, is this a duck uh, or a rabbit? Uh, here's a duck uh, that you see right here. Here's the head, uh, the eye of the duck and the the beak uh, of the duck. Um, but you can also perceive this as being a rabbit. You know, here's the rabbit, again, the rabbit's eye, uh, the mouth, and the uh, ears uh, of the rabbit. So, um, again, you know, context is obviously incredibly important in terms of our visual processing. And sometimes, again, we think that we see things and, and we really don't, or we can see something else um, uh, instead of this is subject to interpretation. Um, here's another very famous uh, visual illusion. This is a receding surface and it looks like this individual here is larger than either this individual or this individual when in fact they they are identical in terms of their size but it's this receding surface that you see here that gives the illusion that this person uh, right here is larger uh, than either one of these two. Um, here's another uh, famous visual illusion. Um, you can view this um, as either uh, a goblet that you see here, okay, or you can view this as a silhouette. Here's a silhouette on this side and a silhouette uh, on this side. 
that you see here. So um, again, um, we can oftentimes see two different things depending upon how we look at it. In this case, oftentimes individuals will view this first as being a, a goblet. Okay, and it's because they view this as being in the foreground and this and this being in the background. Uh, this is a very famous visual illusion called the Ebbinghaus illusion. Uh, take a look at the orange circle uh, that you see here and compare it to the orange circle that you see here. Uh, in the orange circle on the left, this appears to be smaller than the one here. Uh, principally because of um, these balls that you see here. Uh, these large balls um, give the illusion that this is uh, smaller uh, than the, the one that you see here by virtue of the comparison with the smaller uh, balls. Uh, this is a very famous uh, visual illusion too. It's called the Mueller liar um, illusion. Uh, when you take a look at these lines that you see here, um, oftentimes uh, individuals will view this line uh, that you see here as being uh, longer than this line or this line. Uh, and again, it's principally because of these tails that you see here that give uh, the illusion uh, that this is longer than the other two. Uh, so again, uh, they are identical to one another. Uh, but again, these tails uh, that you see here give the illusion uh, that this one that's in the middle is longer. Uh, so, um, you know, these are a few of, you know, some of the famous uh, visual illusions that uh, psychologists uh, um, studying visual processing have been, have been interested in exploring. Uh, here's yet another very famous one. Um, uh, this can be viewed as a young woman or an old woman. Here's the young woman that you see here. Here's her nose. Here's her eyelash. Uh, here's her chin that you see here. Here's her ear. Um, or you can see this as an old woman. Um, this is the nose of the old woman that you see here. Here's her eye. Uh, here's uh, her mouth uh, that you see here. This is a visual illusion that is really related a great deal to a previous experience. Um, individuals um, that are older, um, uh, when they view this, they tend to see the old person. Individuals who are younger, uh, maybe in their teen years or in their uh, 20s, uh, view uh, the younger woman first. So a lot of this is related to experience. Um, this is a very famous um, visual illusion called the Rat Man visual illusion. Uh, if you take a look um, at these uh, series uh, of uh, pictures uh, that you see here, um, this is a, a picture of a, of a uh, rooster. Uh, this is a picture of a dog. This is a picture uh, of a cat. Uh, this is a picture of uh, a rat. And when people see this picture after viewing those animals, they tend to see a rat. Here's the nose uh, of the rat that you see here. Here's the ears of the rat. Here's the rat's tail. Here's the rat's hind leg. Uh, but now take a look at this sequence of pictures that you see here. Uh, this is a boy. Uh, this is a man. Uh, this is a woman. Uh, this too is a woman. And now look at this, what most people will say after viewing those pictures of faces, uh, they will say that this is an older man. Uh, here's the uh, eyeglasses that the older man has on. Here's the older man's nose uh, that you see right here. Here's his ear that you see here. So again, depending upon what you've seen in the past, this can very much influence you know, our expectations. Um, in terms of, uh, of what we see, our previous experience uh, can, can uh, definitely influence um, uh, what we see. So that being said, uh, let's take a look um, at some of the basics of our visual system. This is a, uh, a figure that you've probably seen numerous times, but it does you know, point out some of the main anatomical features of the eye that you should be familiar with. Uh, this is the cornea that you see here, which is the 
protective layer uh, of the eye. Uh, the light is going to enter <coughs> by way um, of the uh, pupil. Uh, and the, the light is going to be focused by the lens uh, that you see here. Uh, and again, this uh, um, uh, uh, the iris the, that you see right here um, is, um, is going to um, either uh, permit uh, a lot of light to come in um it's if it opens up a lot of light is going to come in if it closes down not much light is going to come in again when you're in an environment that's quite dark um, this is uh, this is going to open up uh, a great deal if you're in an environment that's uh, uh, in which there's a lot of bright light this is going to close down um, it's the rear surface of the eye that you see here which we call um, the retina. Uh, that's where the visual receptors are. This is where uh, detection uh, uh, takes place, initially takes place in this retinal layer. And uh, it's this foveal area that you see here where um, the receptors uh, for visual processing are, are very uh, densely packed. Take a look uh, at visual information and where it actually goes. Uh, here's the periphery that we see here. Um, here's our eyes right here. Uh, when we detect something with either the left uh, visual field or the right visual field, um, it's going to be um, uh, detected, of course, uh, by the retina uh, that we see <laughs> in each eye. And that information is going to be transferred to the back of the brain by way of uh, the optic nerve. Uh, and here you can see the optic nerve coming from uh, the left visual field or the left eye. <clears throat> and uh, here's what's called the optic chiasm. That's where these optic nerves uh, cross over. Uh, and uh, information from the left eye is going to be going to both uh, the left hemisphere uh, in the primary visual cortex. And it's also going to be going to the right hemisphere uh, in the uh, right hemisphere's visual cortex, which is right here. These bodies that you see here, they're called the lateral geniculate bodies. This is a major uh, transfer or a relay station for this information that's coming uh, by way uh, of the optic nerves from both uh, eyes. So again, this is a good visual here. Uh, you know, here's our optic nerve uh, that is going to the back of the brain. Uh, and again, this is <clears throat> The first uh, an extremely important relay station in the back of the brain for visual processing. Um, take a look at this figure, uh, the visual uh, processing receptors, the rods and the cones. Um, you can, uh, you know, again, this is, um, you know, located in the back of the eye. Uh, these are the rods and the cones that you see here. Um, I'll have a, a blow up of this in another slide, but there's some anatomical differences, uh, important anatomical differences between the two. They are going to be sending messages uh, to the bipolar layer. Uh, that's these cells that you see right here. That uh, information from the bipolar cells is going to go to the ganglion cells. Here's the ganglion cells that you see right here. Um, a, an interesting and important um, advance in this area, these cells that you see right here that are called amacrine cells, uh, they have um, a very important function that we'll be uh, talking about in just a moment. Uh, but that information that is going to bipolar cell, uh, excuse me, from the rods and the cones, uh, you know, the receptors in that retinal layer uh, to the back uh, or to, uh, to the uh, bipolar cells uh, that you see here, then ultimately to the ganglion cells. And it is um, uh, the axons of the ganglion cells that join up with one another and actually form uh, the optic nerve. And this is an actual photomicrograph uh, that you see here uh, of this artist rendition that you see here. So here's our receptor layer the rods and the cones, uh, and here's our bipolar cells that you see here, and then the ganglion cells 
uh, that you see here that are going to form uh, the optic nerve. Um, <clears throat> Mention the amacrine cells. This is a you know a relatively new advance in terms of our understanding that this is an amacrine cell that you see right here. Uh, and amacrine cells uh, receive information from bipolar cells, and they send that information to bipolar cells as well as ganglion cells. Um, the amacrine cells, their primary function is in terms of responding to shape and to responding to movement. Um, uh, and uh, again, this is uh, something that has been a relatively new um, advance in the field of uh, study of vision. Uh, this is uh, yet another portrayal uh, of the rods and the cones. Um, again, take a look uh, at this layer that you see right here. Again, here's our rods and cones that you see right here in the back. Um, and <clears throat> uh, this area that you see right here, uh, the, the, these are blood vessels that you see right here, uh, and um, uh, uh, the optic nerve um, that you see right here. This is where those ganglion cells are joining up uh, to form uh, the optic nerve. Um, this area um, at the back of the eye uh, this is called the blind spot, uh, and indeed the, the reason why it's called this is because there are very few receptors uh, for visual processing. Um, <clears throat> the receptors um, uh, that are responsible for, uh, you know, these initial uh, stages in terms of uh, visual processing. Um, if you take a look, uh, this is an artist's rendition that you see here of what a rod uh, looks like and what a cone looks like. Uh, so again, you can see this, um, uh, that this is uh, dramatically different uh, from what you see in the case of a rod. And here's, you know, an actual photomicrograph. Here are our, um, uh, rods here. and Here's a cone that you see right here. There's a number of important uh, distinguishing features about rods and cones. If you uh, take a look, um, uh, at the at the rods uh, that you see right here, and again right here, they are very abundant in the periphery of the eye, and they respond a lot to faint light. Black and white visual processing is primarily mediated by, uh, mediated by those rods, uh, and there's about 120 million of them per retina. Um, cones, on the other hand, again, here's a cone, here's a cone that we see right here, are much more abundant uh, in and around the, the fovea. Uh, they're responsible for color visual processing. There is approximately 6 million per retina, uh, and they tend to function uh, in, in bright light. So again, there's a number of important distinguishing features between rods and cones. Uh, anatomically, they're different from one another. Um, they are different in terms of their function. You know, rods are principally black and white visual processing. Cones are principally uh, color visual processing. And um, uh, in terms of their distribution, you know, rods are very abundant in the periphery of the eye and, and uh, not so much in the center of the foveal area. Cones are much more uh, present uh, in the uh, foveal area as opposed to the to the periphery. So again, some important distinguishing um, differences between uh, rods and cone. There are a number of different theories of uh, visual processing, um, and you know you should be aware of some of the basics here. Um, the trichromatic theory, also referred to as the young Helmholtz theory, and that's an, an older theory of visual processing, says that we perceive color by way of uh, different rates of responding by, by different cones, uh, essentially three basic types of cones. Um, each, um, each one is sensitive, again, to different wavelengths. So, for example, we have long wavelength cones that respond to red uh, or yellow. We have medium wavelength cones. They respond best to green and less to yellow. 
and short wavelength cones, and they respond best uh, to blue. Uh, so again, here's the tri you know, representation of the trichromatic theory. You know, here are these different wavelengths uh, that we see here. Uh, and again, uh, we have um, these uh, short uh, uh, wavelength cones, medium wavelength cones, um, uh, and uh, these long uh, wavelength cones. And again, they're responding um, to um, uh, uh, different uh, uh, wavelengths. Uh, so again, long wavelengths, uh, principally responsive to red or yellow. That's what we see down here. Medium wavelength cones respond best to green uh, and less to yellow. See right here. Uh, and uh, short wavelength cones are responding uh, best to blue. So again, this is simply called the trichromatic theory that we perceive color by way of different rates of responding in terms of these three basic types uh, of cones. Another theory is called the opponent process theory, and it's saying something a little bit different. It says that we perceive color in terms of paired opposites, like uh, red to green and yellow to blue. Uh, so the brain has a mechanism then of perceiving color on, on these uh, continuums. Uh, and um, it is thought that uh, one of the mechanisms that's involved with this is the bipolar cells. They're, they're being excited by one set of wavelengths and they're being suppressed or inhibited by another set of wavelengths. So again, here's our opponent process theory. Um, here's the achromatic part of it, the black and white visual processing. Uh, and here's our chromatic uh, uh, part of the opponent process theory in which we are responding. Uh, to these continuums, red to green and, and uh, uh, yellow to blue, uh, as you see here. Um, so, of course, you know, one asks, you know, which theory is it, which is the one that has the, the most support? I think both are probably needed, both are probably important. Uh, the trichromatic theory is principally involved with helping us to understand visual perception um, by, by examining the photoreceptor level. Um, in contrast, the opponent process theory is saying that color visual processing is really a product of how those photoreceptors are communicating with one another and how, how they are interconnected with one another uh, in terms of neural processing. I think that um, there's another theory, certainly, that has been advanced by, uh, by other theorists in this area. It's called the dual process theory. And simply what it's saying is that, uh, you know, our visual processing is really a product of these, of these two things uh, in that we have a trichromatic stage uh, that we see here uh, and an opponent process stage that we see here. So it's really understanding what's happening at the photoreceptor level and it's also under the, uh, the attempt to try to understand what is happening in terms of how those photoreceptors are connected with one another, how they are neurally connected with one another. So it's probably both of these theories that we, we would need to utilize in order to fully accommodate um, uh, color visual processing. Uh, this is a very common test for uh, color blindness. Um, you have uh, these colors, uh, colored numbers that are embedded um, in these, uh, um, uh, in this case, you have a seven. Uh, and a four that's embedded um, in these uh, red uh, and brown uh, background. Uh, and here you have uh, an eight uh, uh, that's in you know red and brown that is embedded in this uh, background, this greenish uh, background that you see here. Um, Color blindness is, uh, is very much related to what is happening uh, in terms of those um, uh, receptors, the cones, uh, and indeed deficits in those cones in terms of uh, your ability to perceive uh, these different uh, wavelengths. So, for example, an individual who is not able to see this 7 and this 4 probably is having you know, some problems <clears throat> in terms of, um, you know, being able to adequately detect uh, these, these colors by virtue of some kind of deficits in those uh, color receptors, the cones. Um, 
a very interesting transition point here uh, concerns the research that was done by uh, Russell Devaloy uh, a number of years ago, back in the uh, early 1960s and early 1970s, in which he tried to map the visual cortex. And what we mean by that is this. He took some monkeys uh, and he injected radio labeled glucose. Uh, you know that glucose uh, is being taken up in the brain tissue in, in tissue that is very, very active. Uh, and indeed, what he finds uh, when he takes x-ray photographs of the surface of the cortex, again, that's the middle portion of this slide that you see right here. He's presenting this visual uh, image. Uh, while uh, the animal's being injected with this radio labeled glucose. And what he finds with these x ray uh, photographs of the surface of the cortex is that neurons that you see here are very active, that are, are almost a representation of what is happening in terms of this visual image that is being presented. So, again, it's almost a perfect representation of that visual stimulus. Now, this was relatively crude work, very sophisticated for that time, um, but it really laid the groundwork for um, some Nobel Prize winning work uh, that was done a few years later by uh, Forsten Wiesel and David Huvel um, at uh, Harvard uh, Medical School. Uh, they won the Nobel Prize for examining what happens in the visual cortex, that's the stray cortex in the back of the brain, uh, what happens when <clears throat> a cat uh, is looking at an image that's in front of them? And they were able to identify three principal types of cells, simple cells, complex cells, and what we call end-stop hypercomplex cells. And we'll take a look at those uh, in, in, in just a few moments. But I also want to make note of the fact that Thorsten and Wiesel were the first ones to use what we call microelectrodes. That is very, very thin, small uh, electrodes in which they can record single cells uh, from the brain. They were the first ones to do this. And it was a, it's a common procedure now, but, it, but at the time it was uh, extraordinary. Uh, and indeed, uh, they really laid the groundwork for so much of what goes on in the field of neurobiology uh, today. So we need to take a look at their research and understand a little bit about it. Um, here is a cat um, that uh, has an electrode uh, uh, to record single cells uh, from the uh, occipital cortex, also called the striate cortex in the back of the brain. And we're going to record action potentials. And we're going to have the cat look at this object that you see here. It's a lighted object, the lighted bar. And that lighted bar can change in its orientation. It can be horizontal, uh, it can be vertical, uh, it can be uh, on its side and partially horizontal and partially vertical. It can be all different orientations. And what we're going to do is we're going to record action potentials that we see here from the back of the brain, from the visual cortex. So when the line is horizontal, and we're recording these, uh, these individual cells, these action potentials uh, in the striate cortex of the brain, there are very few, there are none. When that line, okay, that, uh, that lighted bar is horizontal. But when it begins to change in its orientation from being horizontal to being more vertical, as we see here, we're starting to get, you know, action potentials. And indeed, here is it's almost, you know, perfectly vertical. You're still get you're getting a lot of responding and you get the most responding when it is perfectly vertical. So again, the, the, the response that is occurring in these single cells um, um, is dramatic depending upon the orientation of this lighted bar. Uh, so again, what they simply did was to present this bar at different angles uh, of orientation. And again, when it was uh, horizontal, there was very little responding, but when it was more vertical, there was a lot of responding. So again, contrast this that you see here, again, perfectly horizontal, excuse me, perfectly vertical with perfectly horizontal that you see here. And again, you get a lot of these action potentials and uh, none, uh, 
when the when the line is horizontal. So <clears throat> uh and Wiesel called these dimple skulls. So they're really responding to the orientation of that lighted bar. Um, he, they went about exploring again what they call receptive fields. Uh, again, this is for these these simple you know cortical cells in the striated cortex. They did it mostly in cats uh, and in monkeys. Um, in areas that are marked uh, with pluses, uh, for example, that you see here, uh, these are excitatory receptive fields. Areas that are marked with a minus uh, that you see here. Here's a minus. Here's a minus. Here are pluses. Here's a minus. Here's a minus. Um, Areas that are marked with a minus are inhibitory uh, fields. So the responses that you see to the bar of the light, the more light shines in an excitatory area, the more cell responding you get. The more light shines in the inhibitory area, the inhibitory zone, the less the cell responds. So an individual cortical cell is going to be responding based upon um, uh, how much of the excitatory zone uh, it is actually stimulating and how much uh, of an inhibitory zone. Uh, so it's, so it's, it's really important to understand what is happening in terms of the orientation uh, of that uh, lighted bar uh, in terms of whether or not it's striking, you know, an inhibitory area or an excitatory area. So uh, they also identified what they called complex cells. They also respond uh, to the bar of light, the angle of orientation. But a complex cell is a little bit different. It responds the same for a bar that's in any position, uh, as you see here. Okay, any position. Okay, um, but only okay if it is. Uh, stationary. Uh, 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 again, if, if it's not um, uh, uh, stationary, uh, then, then um, you know, you're going to see an entirely different response. So complex cells are responding then to that bar of light if it is in any position within that receptive field, but they don't respond uh, if it is stationary. So it has to be moving. And indeed, if it is moving, then you're going to see responding. Okay. So again, here's, you know, this is moving. You get a very high response, high response. But now when it stops moving, okay, you get low response. Uh, and indeed, um, uh, this is, a, you know, a separate type of cell in terms of how it goes about responding to that environmental stimulus. Um, you also have what they call end stop cells. Uh, and simply put, what we have here is that that lighted bar, as long as it doesn't go into an inhibitory area, um, you're going to get responding. So again, here you have a strong response. Here you have a strong response. Uh, here you have a strong response. But now look what happens when it goes over into uh, this inhibitory field that you see right here. Um, you get a, a shutdown, a very weak or, or no response. So when you take a look at um, the, the, the different types of cells um, that they were able to document uh, in their research, um, uh, simple cells are in what we call the, the vision one uh, area in the back of the brain. Um, the size of that field is quite small. Uh, again, it's bar or edge shaped. You have fixed excitatory and inhibitory zones. That's the simple cell. Complex cells are in both the vision one and vision two area, and that's something we'll get into uh, a little bit more when we take a look at some of the more recent research that has been done in this area. Um, the size of the receptive field is, is medium. Uh, certainly it's larger than what we see in the, uh, in the case of simple cells. And it's bar or edge-shaped uh, objects, um, you know, without fixed excitatory inhibitory zones, they're responding to a stimulus anywhere, especially um, if it is moving and it is moving perpendicular to its axis. And then we have end-stop cells, principally in the Vision One and Vision Two areas. These are the largest um, uh, receptive fields. 
um, and they're pretty much the same as complex cells but they have strong inhibitory zones uh, at one end so again they were able to document this in their research and this is you know this this first relay station um, in the back of the brain uh, they were the first to to really um, uh, understand you know what is happening in terms of visual stimuli and how they're impacting um, the brain so um, that brings this lecture to a close. Our next lecture is going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about some of the more recent research that has been done in this area. Um, uh, research, for example, um, uh, uh, taking a look at what we call uh, face recognition, uh, and then research uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what happens um, in terms of visual processing, once that information goes to the back of the brain, the striated cortex, then the, then the different uh, neural pathways uh, in the brain uh, in terms of where it is going to, to other parts of the brain. So we'll take a look at that um, in uh, our next lecture.